Welcome to another EduMed video and in this video we'll be talking about the NHS England guidelines for the management of patients in critical care with COVID-19. This is quite a big document, I'll leave a link in the description below to get to the actual document itself but I'm going to go through in the next series of videos just each section in turn and thinking a little bit about it. Now the proviso with all the COVID-19 videos is that things change rapidly and so what might be true now may not be true later. So always keep an eye on the channel to see what the latest information is. Similarly, there's a lot of good information out there on the internet and so do try and keep abreast of this. But this is right as of the 8th of April when the guidance was updated and published. So this is the guidelines itself, this is the clinical guidelines for the management of critical care um, in adults, so not in children, um, during the coronavirus pandemic. And as you can see, this was published on the 8th of April. Things are moving so quickly with this disease that some bits might update as time goes on. <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about the history and examination of these patients, and I think that's important because one of the key statistics that we're starting to pick out with um, in the English data at least is that there are a lot of non-COVID related deaths. Now it's very difficult to know whether this is because people don't have a diagnostic test to confirm that the patient has COVID-19 when they die but I do suspect there's a lot of people who are dying who don't actually have COVID and they may be missed. Certainly before, as an intensivist, I was getting referrals very regularly for patients with quite profound septicemia, septic shock from bacterial pneumonias, bacterial urinary tract infections and so on. I'm seeing a dramatic reduction in the number of people who are being referred with those conditions. Now, I don't think those things have gone away, but I do think that because our focus has been so much on COVID, we are missing those other diagnoses. So part of this is just to understand, first, how broad the diagnostic range is for COVID, but also just to help focus your mind to say, actually, there are other things that we need to think about as well. <clears throat> and I don't want to miss those things. So the history can be really variable and it can go from being completely asymptomatic. And we suspect there's quite a large number of people who are presenting with absolutely no symptoms. There was an interesting paper in the BMJ recently where they did a small sample of patients who came for um, delivery and they saw which of those patients were COVID positive and there was a large number that were. Now, I'm not giving you numbers on this purpose because it was a, such a small uh, study and it was observational that really we can't tease too much out of it other than to say there are certainly patients who are asymptomatic who are carrying the disease. <clears throat> In terms of the uh, acute mild moderate illness, um, about 80% of the patients have that. So the vast majority don't get the severe critical illness and um, multi-organ failure that we're seeing in intensive care. And that can present with anything from a fever, which again doesn't happen to everyone, cough, sputum production. Again, when this first came up, people were talking about the fact that this is a non-separative disease, that you don't get the rhinitis, you don't get sputum production. But actually, the more we're seeing of this disease, the more we are starting to notice that it is a feature of these patients. And then these non-specific features, and anyone who remembers the swine flu, H1N1, um, MERS and SARS outbreaks, remember that a lot of these patients started off with these sort of non-specific symptoms. <clears throat> Something that's been made a big deal of in the um, uh, press and also in the medical literature is this anosmia and loss of taste. Actually, a lot of people get that even with non-COVID infections. But what I want to emphasise here with this slide is how broad the range of um, symptoms are and how non-specific they are. So having a low threshold for um, assessing a patient for COVID-19 is appropriate. It is important to just note that patients do come in with non-respiratory organ dysfunction. This is a multi-organ disease and the more we're seeing of this, the more we're realising just how profound the other organ dysfunctions can be. They can present with renal failure or liver dysfunction and the big deal was made out of the cardiac dysrhythmias and this potential risk for myocarditis. 
Admittedly, at least in my practice, I haven't seen much of that. However, it definitely has been reported in the literature. And then what we all worry about are these hypoinflammatory states where you fall into the sort of H phenotype of the disease with um, consolidative changes and multi-organ dysfunction. These are the ones that uh, tend to make it to intensive care if the patient's appropriate for escalation of care. Just as with swine flu, I think it's really important to just emphasize the fact that they can get GI symptoms. Diarrhea and just abdominal cramps and discomfort could be a presentation of COVID. And don't discount a patient who just has GI symptoms. They should, and generally speaking, my rule is everyone who has symptoms should get a COVID screen when they come to hospital because I think that's the only way we're really going to know um, what's what. And I'll talk a little bit about the COVID screen and the swab tests and the limitations of that later. There is this really interesting phenomena of COVID encephalopathy. And we suspect this is a combination of both a macro and microvascular dysfunction in the brain. But we certainly are seeing this and it's something to be mindful of. So if you do see patients who are confused and don't have the uh, profound hypoxia, this could still be COVID related. Now I mentioned um, swabs <clears throat> for diagnosis. Now in the guidelines themselves, they do suggest that there's a false negative in upper airways um, samples. I can't count the number of patients who are in intensive care now who had initial negative swabs and even continue to have negative swabs whilst intubated and ventilated. And it was a bronchial lavage, either non-directed or directed, that actually gave the diagnosis of COVID. And the rest of the clinical picture was so classical of COVID that we treated them as such. So don't be reassured by a false um, neg by a negative result, because that could well be a false negative, especially from pharyngeal and oral swabs. It seems like the deeper you go with your sampling, so the bronchial lavages, the more accurate it is, and about 90% of patients are getting a positive sample test when doing a bronchial lavage. <clears throat> I think in imaging-wise, chest x-ray can be useful. However, the caveat to that is early in disease, these patients often don't show much in the way of um, interstitial pneumonitis and therefore consolidation on the chest x-ray. As we've known for years and years, chest x-ray just is not that sensitive at looking at lung parenchyma. And so the CT of the chest is probably the gold standard at the moment. Now, um, it shows quite classic subpleural disease and it tends to be quite geographic and patchy. Interestingly, in the um, guidelines, they didn't mention lung ultrasound and there is an increasing amount of literature out there suggesting that lung ultrasound might be useful at the bedside for these patients and actually it saves you having to take this patient to CT especially if they have mild to little symptoms and we have certainly seen in our institution a lot of patients who we ultrasound their lungs we see this geographic subpleural consolidation but they're not particularly hypoxic and so doing a CT scan wouldn't really change our management in the first instance. So it's a great way to actually prevent that extra trip to the CT department. In terms of bloods, there's a couple of interesting things that we're seeing. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a few things. This low lymphocyte count we definitely are seeing. And I think that's pretty similar to what we've seen in a lot of other um, viral infections in the initial stages. There's a variety of different theories for that, and I won't go into that in this talk. However, um, it certainly is a feature of early COVID, at least those who are making it to hospital. The normal procalcitonin, I think, is really useful and something that I've used quite a lot. The slight complicating factor is it's an expensive test. Not all laboratories provide it, but it does seem to differentiate between those patients with bacterial pneumonias and with pure COVID pneumonitis. Now, the other useful thing about having these baseline procalcitonin levels is that by doing serial ones, you can pick up when they develop their bacterial superadded infection on the ventilator. And certainly I've had a few patients where we've picked up bacterial pneumonias 
super adding on to their COVID disease on the procalcitonin. BNP they mention, and I think that is a useful screening test, not just to see whether the patients have evidence of um, pulmonary edema, because some of these patchy changes bilaterally could indicate pulmonary edema, but also I think baselines are useful for those small proportion of patients who develop a myocarditis and secondary pulmonary edema from that. Something I found really interesting and actually has been noted right from the start, but I myself had missed in the literature, is this myositis that these patients get. And you can get quite massive CK rises and rhabdomyolysis in these patients. So actually monitoring that is quite useful. Now, one may ask the question, well, what would you do about it? Um, because you have to balance your fluid therapy, al alkalinization of um, urine can be difficult in these patients, especially with the increased CO2 load if you're finding it difficult to ventilate these patients and you want to keep low transpleural pressures. However, I think in general it is quite interesting just to monitor these things and so preempt whether patients are going to start becoming hyperkalemic, develop AKI and treat them early rather than loading them with loads of fluid, which if they then develop an H phenotype is probably not a great thing. Troponins are also useful and may indicate both um, myositis type myocardial um, involvement, but also what I'm seeing quite worryingly is a lot of hypercoagulable states and lots of micro and macrovascular thrombi. And there's no reason why this might not manifest itself in the heart as well. So regular ECGs are a mainstay of my um, treatment of these patients and also I think having um, troponins at least a baseline and occasional serial troponins every two or three days might be helpful to try and um, preempt these patients. Certainly those patients who suddenly get a stepwise increase in their noradrenaline requirements or go on to noradrenaline, it might be worth doing a troponin just to check. The um, tags that I'm seeing on these patients are quite scary. I'm not seeing any lysis even at 60 or 90 minutes. They don't seem to get fibrinolysis at all. And that might be partly why they are in this hypercoagulable state. The guidelines themselves make a really interesting point of actually showing some things that might help us with markers of severity. I think especially as intensive care doctors, I think this is useful. The high neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, that lymphocyte suppression and an increase in neutrophils does seem to confer badness. And certainly I've seen patients who had a massive increase in their neutrophils and then very shortly thereafter start to develop quite dense bilateral diffuse consolidation on their chest x-ray. A low albumin, I think it's difficult because anyone who's sick, the albumin level does seem to drop just because of the hyperinflammatory state and the shift in production of proteins in the liver to the inflammatory cytokines. But I think they've mentioned it here and I think it's useful just to keep in mind. The things I do think are really quite interesting are the elevated troponin, potentially indicating myocardial strain or even a myocarditis, or possibly even a thromboembolic event. D-dimers and ferritin are really interesting. There is this thought that there may be sort of a HLH type um, overlap with these patients with this sort of cytokine storm. And certainly those patients with very elevated D-dimers or ferritins, they do seem to do worse. Now, we don't have the long-term data for this yet, but anecdotally, at least, I've seen that when D-dimers have suddenly jumped up or the ferritin has suddenly jumped up, the respiratory deterioration seems to come only a short while thereafter, a, couple, a day or even less in some cases. An LDH is also quite interesting. CRP, I've seen increase in most of the patients who have come to intensive care. It doesn't necessarily denote a bacterial infection, but what I have found really useful is using a combination of CRP and procalcitonin. If the CRP has stayed high but it's the same level and the procalcitonin is low, it tends to indicate that these patients haven't got a bacterial superadded infection, and so my threshold for starting antibiotics has been relatively high in those patients. 
However, if I see an increase in CRP and an increase in the procalcitonin levels, my threshold to start those antibiotics drops dramatically. The reason why I think antibiotic stewardship in these patients is important is that, especially in China, we've seen quite a lot of papers coming out of patients developing secondary fungal infections, and it's undoubtedly only a matter of time before we start to get multi-resistant bacterial pneumonias on top of their COVID lung. So from this um, paper, I think it's really important just to bear in mind that you need to have a high index of suspicion for COVID. This is not patients that you're going to be able to um, pick up uh, with a very specific phenotype of presentation. They can effectively present with anything. But I think the really important point that I want to keep emphasizing is that we need to rule out other diseases. Just because COVID exists doesn't mean that all the other things that we were seeing as intensivists have suddenly stopped. They're still probably out there. And so we must screen for these things and doing full septic screens, thinking about abdominal discomfort as could it be a colitis, could it be ischemia, all of the things that we normally think about are still important to rule out. Swabs are not accurate. The thing that I've found the most useful has been bronchial lavages and doing them as non-directed bronchial lavages seems to work quite well. I think bloods are important and this is one of those funny diseases where I think actually I'm going counter to what I've taught my juniors for years and years which is use your clinical skills and your clinical judgment before you start doing lots of tests. In these patients they can sometimes look really well from the end of the bed However, the blood tests and the procalcitonin levels and the ferritin levels, the D-dimers, the troponins, they tend to be able to tease out a picture a little bit better than just looking at them from the end of the bed. You will have heard of the happy hypoxics. I've seen that quite a lot actually before this with just normal flus, but certainly we're seeing a lot of it now with COVID. And in these patients, using investigations like CT and blood tests is useful, just not to miss anything. I hope you found that useful. I'm going to go through the rest of the document in the next set of um, talks, so hopefully people get a bit more of an awareness of what's out there in terms of guidelines, at least in the UK, for critical care management of these patients.